Hydration isn't only for athletes training, it's for all of us. It's a huge part of daily maintenance. When I was in Japan back in July, I spent plenty of time outdoors, walking from place to place, just a hot, sweaty mess. While those convenience stores along the way had some refreshing drinks like Picari Sweat, there was one thing I wish I had brought along with me for the trip, Liquid IV, the number one powdered hydration brand in America. I found out about Liquid IV after getting back, and I'll say the convenient packaging alone makes this a must bring wherever you're going, be it any type of travel, business, or pleasure, after a workout, sometime outside in the heat, or maybe just after a long night with friends. With only one stick and 16 ounces of water, Liquid IV hydrates you two times faster and more efficiently than water alone, while taking in five essential vitamins, that's B3, B5, B6, B12, and C, and three times the electrolytes as leading sports drinks. It comes in 12 tasty flavors. My favorite, personally, is strawberry lemonade and tropical punch. Real people, real flavor, real hydrating. Get 20% off when you go to liquidiv.com and use Crew of Japan, K-R-E-W-E-O-F-J-A-P-A-N, at checkout. That's 20% off anything you order when shopping Better Hydration today using promo code Crew of Japan at liquidiv.com. What are you waiting for? Get hydrated. Hello, I'm Doug, and welcome to the Crew of Japan podcast, a weekly podcast where we take you on audio journeys through Japanese culture. This time on Crew of Japan podcast. Welcome back to Crew of Japan podcast season five. It's finally here. Get hyped. In this episode today, we'll embark on a journey through pop culture history, exploring the fascinating evolution of the Godzilla franchise. From its inception in post-war Japan to its ascent as reigning king of monsters, we'll uncover the cultural significance and enduring legacy of everyone's favorite giant reptilian monster. But what makes Godzilla more than just a monster in a movie? To shed light on this question, we have a special guest joining us today. A familiar voice if you've already listened to our bonus episode about Godzilla Minus One, released back in December. Dr. William Tsutsui, a distinguished scholar and renowned expert in Japanese pop culture especially when it comes to the realm of Godzilla, to the point where he's known by many as Professor Godzilla. With his expertise, we'll gain insights into Godzilla's symbolism. But that original film was made with a clear political agenda. The people that made it wanted to send the message that war was terrible uh, and that atomic weapons could lead to the end of humanity. Uh, and we had to step back from the brink. And their way of expressing these sentiments was through a guy in a rubber suit walking through Tokyo. And what's amazing is how effectively they did it. Its impact on Japanese society. You know, that very well could have been the end of the series at that point. Because even in Japan,、uh, the movies had become something of a joke. But fans really saved the Godzilla franchise. And its evolution into a global icon. I did a survey of Godzilla fans and asked them, what do you like most about Godzilla? And the answer is, perhaps not surprisingly, pretty obvious. He's big and powerful. You know, people love the idea of this gigantic monster. So grab your popcorn and get ready for a deep dive into the world of kaiju as we explore the history of Godzilla, its franchise, and how it became the world's king of monsters. Let's go. Here's what's going on with Japan Society in New Orleans. Be sure to check the show notes for links and more information. Here we go. The 2024 Matsue New Orleans Sister City Exchange program application is now live. This year celebrates the 30th anniversary of the sister city relationship, and you won't want to miss out on this once in a lifetime opportunity. Check the Japan Society website for more information, qualifications, and most importantly, the application itself. On Sunday, March 24th, Japan Society will be doing a group tour of the Gopher Broke Spirit Legacy and Portraits exhibit at the World War II Museum. Check out the Japan Society event calendar for pricing and more details. For more information and details about these events and future events, follow us on the website and social media. Everything will be linked out in the show notes. Hope to see you there. All right, and we are back with Jennifer. Hey, Jen, how are you doing? Doing good. Here to learn about some Japanese monsters. Oh, yeah. And who else better to talk about Japanese monsters, specifically Godzilla, than the author of Godzilla on My Mind and resident Godzilla expert, Bill Tsutsui? So, Bill, welcome to the podcast. Hey, what a thrill it is to be with you. Thanks, Doug and Jen. Yeah. Do you want to take a second to properly introduce yourself? So, my day job is as a university administrator. I'm the chancellor at Ottawa University in Ottawa, Kansas, but I'm also a historian of modern Japan. 
my boring research is on Japanese business and economic history, but what I've enjoyed the most over the past three decades teaching and learning about Japan relates to the King of the Monsters, Godzilla. Question. This is kind of a segue, but you came to New Orleans to give a speech on Godzilla, and we talked about pretty much kind of the overarching themes that New Orleans can kind of relate to you in some regards. We usually ask our guests like if they've ever been, so but we know you've been. Although that was only for literally for like eighteen hours, it wasn't exactly. It was not a good trip. Yeah, <laughs> you were in. I picked you up from the airport or from your hotel, and then brought you to speak. We went to dinner, and then you went back, and then flew out in the morning. <laughs> It was a huge amount of fun, though. What was really fun for me about that presentation was to meet a Godzilla fan from my hometown in Texas, which was not a big town, which was really cool, and to meet someone who actually saw the original Godzilla movie being filmed. So yeah. of all the talks I have given about Godzilla, I'm always going to remember the one in New Orleans. Oh, that's, yeah, that, that's right. I forget the gentleman's name, but he was like talking about how he was on a school bus, right? And he yeah, like drove he was, past. Like, international school, yeah. Yeah, he drove past like the giant Godzilla head or something when they were filming yeah. or something. <laughs> uh -huh. So cool. Cool, yeah. So aside from that, have you ever been to New Orleans outside of that or is that your first time? Many times, five or okay. six times, I think I've been to New Orleans. I think probably like a lot of people, my strong memories are of great food, yep. loud music, and sometimes sticky sidewalks down in the French Quarter. Oh, yeah. Yep, sounds about right. <laughs> <laughs> what I love about New Orleans is, you know, so much of America has become generic now. All the big chains and it all looks the same. Can't tell if you're in Seattle or Cincinnati. You know when you're in New Orleans. Oh, yeah. It is a different place. For sure, for sure. That kind of brings us to our next question. We know your relationship with New Orleans, but now we want to know about your relationship with Godzilla. We want to know, how did you get into this? And then at what point did you decide that you wanted to leverage your fandom into something that ended up becoming you being a literal expert on Godzilla and its global impact? So I just realized earlier this week that I've loved Godzilla for something like 52 or 53 years, <laughs> which is longer than I've loved my wife. We've only been married 33. <laughs> Godzilla is my longest lasting relationship. I first was introduced to Godzilla when I was seven or eight years old, and I still remember it. I was in my parents' bedroom in our house in Bryan, Texas. I was lying on the blue shag carpeting on my stomach on a Saturday afternoon, <laughs> watching the Creature Double Feature from Channel 39 in Houston on our big old wood grain paneled TV set. And a Godzilla movie came on. And it was one of those great 1960s Technicolor ones where Godzilla is cheesy and wrestling with other monsters. And I immediately fell in love. You know, I wanted to be that monster. I wanted to make Tokyo explode. I wanted to knock jet planes out of the sky. So, you know, like a lot of kids, I had this very visceral reaction to Godzilla. I wanted to be big and powerful like him. But at the same time, you know, Godzilla ended up meaning a lot more to me because when I was growing up, there were only two Japanese American families in Bryan, Texas, and very few people knew anything about Japan. My mm -hmm. classmates at school, and I went to Davy Crockett Elementary School, my classmates at Davy Crockett, the only thing they knew about Japan was Pearl Harbor. So when I was a kid growing up and talked about my Japanese heritage, it often ended up with me on the ground being kicked uh, because they'd associated with World War II. Yeah. So I came to recognize pretty quickly, as I recall, that Godzilla was something about Japan that I really liked and that I could be proud of in my Japanese heritage because my friends liked it too. I spent a lot of my childhood playing Godzilla versus King Kong with my best friend. You know, we'd go out at recess. I was always the big lizard. He was always the big ape. And we would <laughs> roll around in the grass having a great time. Uh, and since then, you know, there have been times in my life when I maybe haven't been that open about my Godzilla fandom. You know, when you're a teenager trying to get dates, being a Godzilla fan does not help a whole lot. <laughs> but it really came back just about 30 years ago now when I started teaching Japanese history and used films in my Japanese sur history survey classes and thought one uh, year, why don't I use a Godzilla film? Because, you know, the Godzilla films span Japan's post-war history. There's a lot in those films about Japanese history and culture, especially the original 1954 mm -hmm. film. And I think students could learn a lot. And what I found was students loved it. And students actually did learn a lot. I called it my sucker punch because nobody imagines they're going to learn anything from a science fiction film about a giant lizard walking through Tokyo. 
And yet it <laughs> turns out there is so much good stuff in there. And the students became so engaged with it um, that, you know, some semesters I was using two or three Godzilla movies. And I got this reputation as Professor Godzilla from that. Okay. All right. That's awesome. And yeah, I've been noticing a pattern with higher education, especially with like Japanese studies. A lot of professors are now utilizing Japanese pop culture in their classrooms to teach curriculum dealing with Japanese culture with a crossover of that pop culture. You know, you are so right, Jen. When I started, so that was back in the 1990s, I started teaching Godzilla. My colleagues made fun of me for doing it. And people would roll their eyes when they heard that I was writing a book on Godzilla. They'd say, oh, you're one of those people. Oh, gosh. <laughs> so I really, I think, was on the cutting edge of academics who were really taking Japanese pop culture seriously. And so I'm really pleased now to be able to look at all those people and say, I told you so. You know, this right. really is a great way to engage people with Japan and teach some serious things. Well, to get on with that, Godzilla is regarded as like king of the monsters, but is it the first ever pop culture kaiju or were there other influences that inspired Godzilla and other kaiju creations that came after? Yeah, so in terms of kaiju, in the sense that that concept of kaiju is Japanese, in a way, Godzilla is the first kaiju, but there were prior giant monsters cinematically that inspired the Godzilla movies. What's usually thought of as the first giant monster movies back in 1925 called The Lost World, based on a story by, by Arthur Conan Doyle. And that's where the great stop motion animation special effects guru Willis O'Brien really cut his teeth and made some wonderful special effects scenes of dinosaurs fighting each other uh, and on the loose. And that was followed up by sort of what, what you got to call the mother of all giant monster movies, King Kong in 1933 in Hollywood. Uh, so those were sort of the post-war origins uh, of kaiju. Uh, and King Kong returned and really was the immediate inspiration for Godzilla. Uh, in uh, 1952, King Kong was re-released internationally, and it proved extremely popular at the box office, including in Japan. And that inspired American filmmakers to uh, work on other giant monster movies. So 1953, The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms came out, and it is a great movie. It, too, was a direct inspiration for Godzilla because the monster there appears uh, because of atomic bomb testing that melts a glacier. So that brontosaurus then swims down from the Antarctic and decides it wants to go spawn in New York City and ends up being roasted alive in Coney Island. Very, very <laughs> cool picture. And Japanese filmmakers noticed uh, that these were possible, and that inspired them in many ways to create Godzilla. They said, hey, something about audiences these days, want to see giant destructive monsters? Let's make one of our own. And that brings us to Godzilla, the original film that was released in 1954. But can you help us frame the setting of Japan, like the historical and cultural context surrounding the film? In what ways was this movie a reflection of post-war Japan? Watching the movie, you really get a good snapshot of what Japan was like in 1954. So remember, World War II ends in 1945 with the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The only time atomic weapons have been used uh, in war, they're dropped uh, on Japan. Even before those bombings, though, Japan had been pretty much devastated uh, by the war. Uh, almost 70 Japanese cities were firebombed during the war, so places like Tokyo and Yokohama and Osaka uh, were almost burned to the ground during the war with huge loss of life in the process. So the fact that Godzilla was made less than a decade after the defeat, the atomic bombings, the real destruction of Japan meant these were still very much raw memories for the Japanese people and unresolved traumas for them. The Japanese were still having sort of a collective PTSD nine years after the war. And you can see that in the original Godzilla movie. Adding to that, right, was that the Americans militarily occupied Japan after the war from 1945 to 1952. And during that time, the Japanese were very controlled and regulated by the American army. And one of the things they cracked down on was information about the atomic bombings. So really, other than a very short window in 1945 and 1946, where the Japanese media could talk about the A-bombs, after that point, the Americans didn't want 
the Japanese discussing the bombs because they thought it would rouse anti-American sentiments. So consequently, not only are the Japanese traumatized by the experience of war and defeat and atomic bombing, they can't discuss these things because the Americans say you can't, and because it becomes sort of a taboo in Japanese society to talk about such painful memories. Right. And so you can see, you know, when you get to this point in Japanese history, there's all this built up psychological stress in the Japanese, and it needs some outlet. And that's what the makers of the Godzilla films were tapping into. To get ready for this interview, I actually watched the original on HBO Max, they have it. And yeah, you get that sense from it. Just you could feel the time period that it's taking place in. Yeah. And, and we're going to get into the themes and everything in a second too. But you could feel like the one of the characters, he did not want what happened during the war to happen again with yeah. his like scientific discovery. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, that kind of thing carried, carried through. And you can see how heavy it weighed on him and the rest of the cast. What surprises people that never saw that original movie is how dark it is mm -hmm. and how serious it is. You know, yeah, a lot of people think of Godzilla as being sort of silly, you know, because uh, a lot of the movies in later decades were. But that original film was made with a clear political agenda. The people mm -hmm. that made it wanted to send the message that war was terrible uh, and that atomic weapons could lead to the end of humanity. Uh, and we had to step back from the brink. And their way of expressing these sentiments was through a guy in a rubber suit walking through Tokyo. And what's amazing is how effectively they did it. Yeah. I mean, they flat out said it. Like, I feel like one of the closing minutes of the movie, the, the older gentleman that was a scientist basically said, like, we can't do this ever. You know, like basically yeah. flat out uh -huh. made the statement. Two years prior, if this movie had been released, they probably wouldn't have been able to make any of that commentary. That's exactly right. And it is, you know, at the end, it really is a warning. Yeah. And it's a little bit heavy handed if you watch <laughs> it, but it makes you realize what a significant issue this was for Japan at the time. Remember, this was the middle of the Cold War by 1954. So American nukes were pointed at Russian nukes and Japan was caught in the middle. Uh, yeah. Japan was very vulnerable, very weak. They'd already suffered uh, atomic attacks. So it really channels not just sort of entertainment value for the movie, but the survival of the nation. Well, and you mentioned a guy in a rubber suit. Over time, we've seen Godzilla go from like a rubber suit actor to a ferocious computer graphic animation while tackling a variety of societal and political and environmental themes along the way. How has Godzilla evolved over the decades? both in terms of his appearance, but also narrative themes. Let me just say, since you mentioned uh, the man in the rubber suit, I want to just <laughs> mention that I think this is one of the great things about the Godzilla movies uh, and one of the great contributions of Japan to world culture. In the day, uh, people thought uh, the techniques that Toho Studios, the maker of the Godzilla movies, used, literally putting an actor in a rubber suit uh, to portray a monster walking through miniature toy cities was uh, cheesy special effects. It was considered cheap. Uh, it's considered cheesy. And yet, if you watch the movies today and recognize that, boy, these movies were made on a budgetary shoestring. Uh, they mm -hmm. cost almost nothing by Hollywood standards. The level of craftsmanship and realism that they managed to achieve is pretty darn phenomenal. And I would go even further and say a lot of the success of the series over the decades is due to the fact that it had a man in that rubber suit because there is something about Godzilla that is lacking in the sort of CGI creatures we see today uh, on our theater screens in that you could always relate to Godzilla as a human being. Even if you were caught up in the movie and thinking this is a giant lizard walking through Tokyo, on some level, your mind is still saying, this is shaped like a human being. This moves like a human being. Godzilla's actually a guy underneath. <laughs> and it gave you an ability to relate to the monster that I think is the secret here. The monster's not just some sort of alien, evil them. The monster is slightly human too. It's us. And therefore, you can be empathetic to it as well as fear it. No. And I think that kind of identification as well as fear makes Godzilla something special. I got to say, today, I miss having the guy in the rubber suit, even if the special effects honestly are a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> so let me talk about how Godzilla has changed uh, over time a little bit. Uh, you know, the Godzilla in that first movie was very dark, 
very destructive, very scary, actually, Mm -hmm. as part of the strong political themes in that movie and to reflect the age in which it was made. The sequel started almost immediately in Japan. The first sequel was made in 1955. And then uh, starting in the 1960s, uh, a new Godzilla movie essentially becomes an annual ritual in Japan. And by the 1960s, Japan had changed considerably from 1954. Uh, yeah. Japan had grown considerably richer during that time. The economy boomed in the late 1950s and into the uh, 60s. People were getting wealthier. Tokyo's skyline was growing. And honestly, audiences didn't want to see a big angry monster come and destroy everything they'd worked so hard to achieve after the war. So consequently, Godzilla was reframed as a friendlier monster and more of a defender of Japan than an enemy of Japan. And that's when all of the other kaiju were rolled out as enemies Godzilla could fight. You know, all those wonderful monsters that we celebrate, Mothra, King Ghidorah, Rodan, Baragon, and so forth, all were rolled out by Toho Studios as baddies that Godzilla could take on and defend Japan from. And so, you know, Godzilla became more lighthearted, more positive, more of a hero uh, and defender of Japan. Japanese film industry was also changing a lot at this time. And the main audience for movies by the late 1960s was children. Mm -hmm. And so whereas that first movie was aimed at adults with its serious political message, by the mid to late 1960s, the movies were made for kids. uh, And they were made very quickly. Not a huge amount of money was spent on them, but they became very fun. Uh, And, you know, while people will criticize those movies for being, you know, having pretty cheesy production values and uh, pretty crazy narratives and uh, (laughs) so forth, they really are a lot of fun uh, to watch today and have a chuckle with. What do you consider to be some key milestones in Godzilla's cinematic journey and its influence on popular culture? Yeah, great question. So 1954, right, the start of the series, Godzilla is born. 1962, then, is one of the great movies in the series, King Kong versus uh, Godzilla. And, you know, before that time, Toho Studios had not committed to Godzilla as their leading man. They tried out another number of other monsters in uh, films of their own. But when they got permission from Hollywood to use King Kong, they decided, let's put Godzilla up against him. And that movie proved so successful that from then on, Godzilla really became the uh, sort of keystone kaiju. The basic mode from then on was Godzilla versus fill in the blank of another monster. uh, And that was the formula that was used after that time. By the 1970s, the formula was getting sort of tired, you know? It's like if you watch the A-Team. If you watch more than a couple episodes, you know what's going to happen every single (laughs) minute uh, in those shows. And that had become the way with Godzilla. And audiences were declining. So in 1975, last Godzilla movie in that original run of them came out. And the studio decided they're giving Godzilla a pink slip. He's going on hiatus. No more Godzilla movies. And, you know, that very well could have been the end of the series at that point, because even in Japan, uh, the movies had become something of a joke. But fans really saved the Godzilla franchise, Uh, especially uh, kids who had grown up with Godzilla in Japan, uh, started holding film festivals on Japanese university campuses. Uh, The studio recognized why are so many people wanting to, you know, show these movies? These are terrible movies. (laughs) But the fans said, we want more. And so in 1984, Godzilla came back. You know, there have been other times since then when the series has sort of petered out for a little bit. But, you know, it has always kept coming back. You know, we're now on 30 live action films in Japan, three full length animated features uh, from Toho Studios. And starting in 1998, uh, Hollywood got into the act. And that's another that was a huge moment uh, when TriStar decided to make the first Hollywood Godzilla. Not a great movie, I will say. (laughs) Not one of my favorites. Some people I know grew up with that movie, um, but I always call it the Matthew Broderick Godzilla, uh, or Godzilla (laughs) in name only, Gino. Uh, But it really brought Godzilla to a larger global audience and uh, very much set the stage then for 2014 and the beginning of the legendary MonsterVerse 
Godzilla's, which has truly rocketed uh, Godzilla uh, into uh, uh, sort of the stratosphere of pop culture icons. For sure. So we talked about Godzilla's impact in Japan from the 1950s release through the 60s and 70s when it kind of became that movie of the year, flavor of the year, villain of the year type thing. You know, then the reboot and then eventually getting to a global section where we had Hollywood producing Godzilla films. I don't want to say in tandem with Japan producing. Uh, did, did Japan have a lot of films come out during that? I'm kind of hazy on the... 90s and 2000s. They were. They were pretty steady about producing them. So a series came out from 1984 to 1995. Okay. Uh, then there was another little hiatus, and then Godzilla came back in 1999. And then okay. that continued up through the 50th anniversary film, Godzilla Final Wars. Got it. And that really is when Toho again thought, boy, maybe Godzilla's out of gas. Because <laughs> that, that Final Wars film, there were some good parts about it, but it really disappointed a lot of fans and didn't do well at the box office. And it probably, as much as anything, was the legendary deal that brought the franchise back okay. in Japan and period. And I feel like the power of nostalgia, too, probably helped. <laughs> yeah. It really does. I mean, and now that's a global fan base, right? You know, there mm -hmm. are people around the world. And I actually think some of the most rabid Godzilla fans, and I include myself in that number, are in the United States. One of the funny things is, until fairly recently, Godzilla wasn't that big in Japan. You know, a lot of people remembered growing up with Godzilla, so they had this kind of affection for Godzilla, maybe like someone of my generation has for ALF, you know, but it wasn't really considered to be a touchstone of Japanese culture. It was only when uh, it became truly big globally, the Japanese said, wow, that's pretty cool that everyone, you know, in the bigger world uh, appreciates Godzilla. Maybe we should think about it again. So what is that universal appeal that has this character resonating with audiences around the world? And then you kind of touched on it a little bit earlier, like back in the older movies, there's a person, you had a little piece of a humanity inside of Godzilla, or he was protecting Japan from outside monsters and things like that. You know, there was yeah. things in, in Japan where maybe it was easy to relate, but like globally, what made this character really transcend? And is it the fascination with, you know, as a kid growing up, I was big into dinosaurs, my youngest or my oldest, well, both of them. They're really big into dinosaurs too growing up. So uh, is it that kind of thing? And then you take dinosaurs and you say, oh, well, Godzilla is kind of a dinosaur. And he looks, and is it that kind of thing where it launches it and that you grasp onto it? Because again, there's nostalgia. There's a lot of things, but what is it? What is that universal appeal? We can't, I'm trying to, <laughs> I've spat out like 8 million different examples or possibilities, but what is it? What is it that grasps audiences? I think there the are 8 million different possibilities. <laughs> I think all of them are the right answer. You know, so when I wrote my book, Godzilla in my mind back in 2004, I did a survey of Godzilla fans and asked them, what do you like most about Godzilla? And the answer is, perhaps not surprisingly, pretty obvious. He's big and powerful, you know? People loved the idea of this gigantic monster. And what a lot of people followed that up with was, he always fights for what's right, and he always wins. And so people wanted to see a monster, a good monster, a defending monster uh, that was uh, protecting Japan, and they liked the fact uh, that he was a winner in the end. So I think in many ways, that's the universal element of the Godzilla films that has allowed them to speak to audiences that really don't understand of the, any of the Japanese politics or history in these movies. You know, if you look at some of those movies back from the 1960s, they're critiquing things like um, uh, corruption in government, commercialization in Japanese society, pollution from Japanese industry. Most people growing up don't pay any attention to that, right? They're right. just a fun movie about a monster attacking Tokyo. And that's enough, it seems. You know, I think there is, you know, one other thing about Godzilla that makes it so powerful over the decades. And that is, unlike James Bond, where, you know, someday Sean Connery's going to get old and die, you know, the monster, you can keep making rubber suits forever. Yeah. And Godzilla can be constantly reborn. He can be evergreen, and he can also address changing issues over time. And I think we've seen that. While mm -hmm. the anti-nuclear issue has been almost consistent across the years, Godzilla has been able to respond to what scares audiences at any particular time, from environmental disaster to more recently natural disasters and COVID.
you mentioned COVID there. And I remember actually during your speech, when you came to New Orleans, you briefly mentioned that there too. Could you expand on that a little bit, if you don't mind me asking? I know this wasn't a planned question or anything like that. So we never have a movie of Godzilla versus a no- novel coronavirus. Yeah. So it's not that obvious. <laughs> but, you know, what has always struck me is, you know, in that original movie back in 1954 and then through the series, Godzilla is giving a physical form to something that is invisible right? Radiation, you can't see radiation. You can see its impacts if it explodes in your city. But radiation is this invisible, terrifying force that is scary because you can't get a visual handle on it. Godzilla gives it a form. And the coronavirus is the same way. It's this invisible terror in our society that seems impossible to fight. One reason why I think the Godzilla franchise has really flourished in recent years and continues to flourish is because in many ways, the sense of anxiety in our society has risen to a new level, very similar, I think, to the Cold War. But now, rather than fearing thermonuclear destruction by the superpowers, we're afraid of things like COVID. We're afraid uh, of things like deterioration of democracy and consensus in our society of governments that can't be effective in dealing with our problems. So I think, you know, a lot of that sense of anxiety that drove the Godzilla series uh, 70 years ago is driving its resurgence today. Okay. Yeah. So we actually had a question that came in from one of our listeners. So Seth, if if you're listening, I hope you are. (laughs) Here's your question. (laughs) Um, And I hope I do it justice. But would you consider, and this is kind of, when I first heard it, I, I never thought of it this way. But would you consider Godzilla and the franchise that Godzilla became one of the original cinematic universes, like the the concept of a cinematic universe that influenced or potentially influenced modern day world building through cinematic universes like MCU and things like that? You know, for example, King Kong was, I don't want to say retconned, but -hmm. King Kong was brought into the Godzilla continuity. Similarly, how... The Hulk was kind of brought into it, even though the Hulk wasn't MCU. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So Ed Norton, I think, was the one that was mm-hmm. like the the one that ended up getting retconned. They worked that in. But it wasn't MCU originally until later on. Another example might be, you know, spin-offs featuring monsters introducing Godzilla or like Gamera, like kind of showing up, yeah. having his own independent movie, but then also having a movie with Godzilla, kind of like team ups for lack of a yeah. better term. Yeah. What do you think of that? Like, do you consider Godzilla kind of being the founding father of cinematic universes? You know, I got to say, this is a brilliant question because I'd never thought about the Godzilla franchise in this way, but that's exactly right. I think it really was the pioneer in this regard. Because as I think about all the cinematic universes out there, you know, Star Wars immediately comes to mind, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, And so that predated Marvel. And then, you know, as I was sort of kicking around, I thought, well, maybe Planet of the Apes uh, was even a little bit before that. Those are still coming decades after Godzilla first appeared. Right. Uh, And we know that uh, George Lucas, when he was making Star Wars, was very influenced by samurai films. So who knows if Godzilla was kicking around back then, too? But I think definitely the pattern we have now seen being quite common, especially in sci-fi cinema, but more broadly as well, definitely had origins in Godzilla and was well established even by the 1960s, right? As you mentioned, Godzilla was fighting King Kong in 1962. A couple years later, it was Godzilla versus Mothra, and Mothra had started with her own movie a couple years earlier. And then it spins off uh, not just into uh, other films and other spin-off series. Mothra ultimately gets her own movie series many decades later. Uh, but through what the Japanese call the media mix, Godzilla goes into comic books, goes into manga, goes into animation, into anime, and goes into advertising, novels. Godzilla really infuses a huge range of Japanese culture. And ultimately, I think, draws us all into the Godzilla universe. Right. <laughs> we've all grown up with Godzilla in one way or another. It's our universe, too. I'm glad Seth brought that to me. We were chatting last weekend and he brought yeah, that up. Yeah, that was I'm like, such a, a great film theory right there. I know, mm-hmm. I know, I know. I had to do some more digging on that. See if there's any other ties behind the scenes <laughs> like way back then. But let's look at Godzilla today and then the years to come. Because, you know, like you had mentioned the legendary universe, the Monsterverse. I mean, that's a Godzilla continuity of its own. 
Yeah. Um, I feel like it taps a little bit more into the original kind of concept of Godzilla than, you know, like the Matthew Broderick yeah. <laughs> version. But, um, you know, we have a lot of content coming out now. Over the years, we've had like Godzilla and King Kong Skull Island. You had Godzilla versus King Kong. Now we have the new Apple series that just Apple Plus series that just came out Monarch, which I still need to watch. Um, and then Godzilla X King Kong. I don't know how to pronounce Godzilla yeah. and King Kong. <laughs> <laughs> Buddy cop movie with Godzilla mm-hmm. and King Kong. <laughs> you know, we have a lot of stuff coming out. And on top of that, we've had, you know, Japanese releases like Shin Godzilla year, a few years ago. We had Godzilla minus one literally came out last week. What are your thoughts on the current state of the franchise and the brand in, in the direction it's headed? First of all, this is the best time in history to be a Godzilla fan. There has never been so much creative attention lavished on Godzilla, so much critical attention on Godzilla, and simply so much Godzilla merchandise to buy. Yeah. If people listening to the podcast could see my office, they would realize, you know, (laughs) I'm keeping, you know, vinyl figurine makers around the world in business because of all the Godzilla toys I've got. I have uh, a friend who could maybe even keep up with you. (laughs) My wife took a picture of his like case or like, I think it's like 30 something Godzilla figure, like big ones. There we go. A man after my own heart. (laughs) I'll have to to get the picture and send it to you. (laughs) You know, uh, the franchise is absolutely booming. I think there are a few reasons for this. One is that finally Toho Studios realized that they need to market Godzilla as a property. In order to market it properly, they have to let go of it a little bit. For a long time, Toho felt the way to protect Godzilla was to clamp down and make sure that nobody did anything with Godzilla but them. Yeah, and I feel like that's a common notion with Japanese media is don't let it go. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. You know, I I have said many times, you know, the only thing in this world scarier than Godzilla is Godzilla's lawyers, uh, because <laughs> they would send out cease and desist orders like nobody's business. They shut down car washes in Arkansas that, you know, had Godzilla, you know, painted on the side of their wall. So oh uh, they finally realized uh, that by being canny about licensing and by hiring some talent abroad, they could really grow this franchise. But then, you know, the big breakthrough was having MonsterVerse and having Legendary take it on. And honestly, you know, as you said, Doug, the fact that the people of Legendary decided to look back to the origins of the Godzilla series, and even though they brought 21st century Hollywood filmmaking talent to the films, they still kept some of the essence of the original Godzilla. That there was some heart uh, to the monster and that there was also some political meaning there as well. So I think the 2014 movie, um, uh, Godzilla, really was a strong contribution to the franchise. It was a great film. It was an exciting film to watch. And yet it also contained some serious political commentary on natural disasters. You know, Mm -hmm. most notably 311 in Japan, the tsunami, earthquake, and uh, nuclear meltdown. But it also referenced things like the San Francisco earthquake and Hurricane Katrina. And fears that we all have of natural disasters and the inability of our governments to take care of us in those moments. I think what is really, really neat right now is we're having movies coming out both from Hollywood and from Japan. Yeah, yeah. And I will tell you, one of the things I feel is the success and the quality of the Hollywood movies in the MonsterVerse have forced Toho Studios to up their game. They have hired really fine directors to make the last two movies, Shin Godzilla and Godzilla Minus One. You know, not just lifelong Godzilla fans, not just somebody who's, you know, sitting on the back lot and doesn't have anything to do that day. You know, they have hired people with real vision as directors and good chops for making those movies. And the most recent two from Toho have been very substantive, engaging and crowd pleasing films. The 2016 film was Shin Godzilla was aimed more at Japanese audiences. It was a little yeah. bit slow paced for Western. There were too many committee meetings uh, for Western <laughs> audiences, frankly. But uh, the most recent one, there are no committee meetings in that film. <laughs> and it is, it is much better. I haven't seen the entirety of Shin Godzilla because I actually, the first time I watched it was on a plane flying from New Orleans to Minneapolis. And it wasn't, uh-huh. I started it too late into my flight where I wasn't able to finish it. <laughs> But yeah, I lived and worked in Japan in an office setting at times, in a teacher office, but an office nonetheless. And yes. Yeah, it's like that. Meetings and uh, yeah, paperwork, red tape, 
Yeah. It's very representative, like you said, <laughs> maybe more intended for Japanese audiences in terms of understanding the bureaucracy that goes on behind the scenes. In one review I wrote of that, I said they should have named the movie Godzilla versus the Establishment because <laughs> it really is a criticism of Japanese in a, it, Japan's ineffective political leadership and of the way things are always done in Japan, that bureaucracy. And there's a beautiful scene at the end. And I don't want to spoil it for you, Doug, if you didn't get to this on your flight. <laughs> I've been but looking for at, where I can stream it online. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to find it. At the end, they capture Godzilla right down in front of Tokyo Station. Uh, and, you know, that's an area where there are a lot of office buildings uh, all around the station. And in order to destroy Godzilla, they detonate those office buildings and bring them down. And so as the buildings are falling down, literally you can see inside the offices and there are all these filing cabinets and fax machines and Xerox <laughs> machines falling on Godzilla. And it's like this weight of doing things administratively in Japan is trying to kill the monster. I, I thought you were going to say they pinned him down in front of Tokyo Station and they were making him hanko all these paperwork <laughs> saying that he's never going to come back to Japan and do this ever again and promise. And <laughs> I wouldn't put it past them. <laughs> I would like to see a Godzilla sized Hanko. It would just say Gojira, but you know. Like... <laughs> <That's right. laughs> the two most recent Godzilla movies from Japan have been very critical of Japanese society. It really is quite refreshing to watch them and to see uh, the way in which they really look towards a more open society in Japan, a society sort of more driven by the needs and the desires of the individual citizen. Mm -hmm. And there's a kind of uh, yearning for more freedom in there, which is which is pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. Obviously, we know that there's other movies coming out for the MonsterVerse, and there's a series that's kind of giving it a little bit more world building and, and background. For the Japanese franchise, what do you see in the future? I mean, I feel like at this point, they know they got to keep it going to some extent. How or what storyline or where they pick up from this movie you know, it all, all depends. They, they could just maybe make it like where they jump from Showa to Heisei to, you know, <laughs> the, just however they want to jump. Where do you see it going from here? I think the uh, critical and financial success of Godzilla Minus One will mean they will learn from that. Oh, for sure. Money talks. Uh, I know <laughs> the director, Yamazaki Takashi, has said he'd love to direct another one. I have to say, having seen it, I'd love to see him direct another one yeah. too because he did a really good job. But if not, you know, I hope they learn from this that we need to get some, some quality directors working on these projects. We don't have to spend a lot of money on this. That's one of the phenomenal things. The budget for Godzilla Minus One was 15 million bucks. You yeah. know, that is a small fraction of what Legendary spent on Godzilla versus Kong. They might have spent 15 million on like one character. Exactly. <laughs> no kidding. You know, well, I loved Godzilla versus Kong. And I actually thought that movie was just right for the post-pandemic moment. We didn't want sober musings on geopolitics at that point. We wanted to see a big ape fighting a big lizard in Hong Kong, and then both of them teaming up and fighting a giant robot. That's what we wanted. That's cathartic. That's brilliant. Yeah. Still, boy, they spent a lot of money uh, to make oh, that movie. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. I can imagine. So we've saved the best for last. What are your top three favorite Godzilla films? And would these be the same three you would recommend someone watch? I'm going to go even further and say these are three Godzilla films, which if you are interested in Japan and you haven't seen them, you are culturally deprived. OK, <laughs> so you've got to go out and watch them if you haven't. The first one is the 1954 Gojira. That is really a classic of world cinema. It figures on almost all lists of the 50 Japanese greatest Japanese films of all time. It truly is a classic. And that'll really make you think about that post-war moment, about Japan's nuclear fear, and uh, about how far the country has come in 70 years. For a slightly different take, I really love Godzilla versus the Smog Monster, uh, <laughs> also known as Godzilla versus Hedera. Some people think of this as the worst Godzilla movie uh, of all time. This is the movie famously where Godzilla flies on his tail. Mm -hmm. But what I love about this movie is it is psychedelic, it is crazy, but it also has a very strong political message. It is pro-environment, anti-pollution, 
and it makes its message in some pretty unexpected ways. You know, the Godzilla movies generally don't have that much graphic violence in them. There's almost no blood in Godzilla movies. I think there's like one kiss in the whole series, right? You know, that's as racy as Godzilla movies get. <laughs> but at one point in Godzilla versus the Smog Monster, the Smog Monster, which is like this blob of stuff from the base of Tokyo Bay, flies over a schoolyard and all the school girls, girls out doing their calisthenics fall down dead. And it's like, wow, at a time when people were saying pollution in Japan is so bad that human life might not be possible there in another 10 years, that's sort of scary stuff, you know, yeah. but in this crazy wild movie. So that's number two, Godzilla versus Smog Monster. And then third, until recently, I would have said, see Shin Godzilla. I'm now saying, see Godzilla minus one. All right. So get out to the theaters, watch that movie. You will not be disappointed. Jen, you're going to have to find a babysitter. I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I heard it actually was it was a, supposed to be a short release, right? And then it got extended out a little bit longer. So you have more time. You have more time, Jen. Good. I need it. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> right. You know, it has it has been so successful at the box office, and there's been such good word of mouth about that movie. This is what really excites me as a Godzilla fan. I remember when I saw the first legendary Godzilla in 2014 in a gigantic suburban 20 plexes in uh, mm -hmm. Dallas, Texas. And it was packed. Every seat was taken. At the end, everybody in that place was up in their feet cheering on Godzilla, <laughs> including my wife who hates Godzilla. That to me was one of my great moments as a Godzilla fan. I just went to see uh, Godzilla Minus One for the second time up in Lawrence, Kansas. And the movie theater wasn't quite full. It was a, you know, a Wednesday evening, early showing. Yeah. And yet, as we left, everyone leaving that theater was saying things like, what a great movie. That was cool. I could see that again. I didn't expect this to be so good. That's another great moment as a Godzilla. Well, then, yeah, I definitely have to go see it because I enjoyed Shin Godzilla. So, I mean, now I got to see this one. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. This one was good. It was good. That kind of brings us to the end of our talk about Godzilla. But uh, I wanted to give you an opportunity to kind of bring any attention to your book or, or where people can find you, whether it's social media or your website. I know you have a website. If you want to steer people that way to find out more about you and your work and things you've done and other things you're working on, maybe in the future. By all means, you know, my book is quite old now. It's 2004, Godzilla on my mind, 50 years of the king of monsters. I've often thought about updating it, but it would be such a big job now. When I wrote that book, in a couple of weeks, I could read everything written in English about Godzilla, uh, essentially. There just wasn't that much stuff. But now it's such a global cultural phenomenon uh, that updating that is a bit daunting to me. But I hope people would still find that an interesting read, an interesting introduction to the series. My website is billsutsui.com. Uh, that has lots of updates on uh, what I'm working on, where I'm publishing things, uh, where I'm giving talks. And if you go to YouTube, you can hear me talking about Godzilla. And if you are enterprising, you can even find uh, a, a music video about Godzilla with me included. So a music uh, video. Uh, check that out by all okay. means. Okay. Might have to put that in the show notes so people can find <laughs> it a little bit easier. <laughs> well, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much. Yes, thank you. For joining us. This is so much fun. We've been, we meant to do this in season four. And then I think what happened, we just were kind of rushed to get things lined up and it just kind of didn't happen. But we're like, absolutely, this is a priority for season five. We got to get Godzilla in there. We got to get Bill in here. I know we had talked about it when you came to give your speech. So, And this is a, such an awesome podcast. You know, y'all have done so many wonderful topics and had so many fabulous guests like Matt Alt and, you know, others. I mean, I'd love to hear Matt talk about Godzilla for half an hour or two. <laughs> and he could, I'm sure. <laughs> oh, he could. He could. He has his own podcast. I, I, yeah. I'll I'll share it out there. Pure Tokyo Scope. That's, that's it. it. That's good. Yeah. But yeah, they, they talked about it quite a bit recently. But yeah, like, I'm glad you enjoyed it some of the episodes and, and our guests too and we're adding you to our catalog of awesome guests and so we're really thrilled that you were able to join us today i'm totally honored thank you so much thank you and that's it for this week's episode thank you so much for tuning in to the season five premiere of crew of japan podcast 
A very special thank you to Professor Godzilla himself, Dr. William Tsutsui, for joining us today to take us on a deep dive into Godzilla's legacy as a monster, a franchise, and as an icon. And it's a good time to be a Godzilla fan too. Between the release of Toho's worldwide box office hit Godzilla Minus One and Legendary's own take on Godzilla, coming at us with the Apple Plus TV series Monarch Legacy of Monsters and the upcoming release of Godzilla X-Kong, Godzilla and Kong, whatever it's called. There are plenty of ways to get your Godzilla fix. Oh, and you know, another way to get your Godzilla fix is to check out Bill's book, Godzilla On My Mind, 50 Years of the King of Monsters. Or you know, if you haven't already, go back and check out our bonus episode at the end of season four, where Bill and I discussed Godzilla Minus One. We actually wanted to call that Crew of Japan Podcast Season 5 Episode Minus One, but unfortunately Simplecast doesn't allow negative numbering of episodes, so we just made it a bonus episode for Season 4. Just saying, we'll have it linked out in the show notes. What Godzilla movie is your favorite? Share with us on Instagram, Facebook, X, or Twitter. Ah, oh, damn it, I just said X. TikTok, LinkedIn, Blue Sky, YouTube, or wherever else you can find us on social media. K-R-E-W-E-O-F-J-A-P-A-N-P-O-D-C-A-S-T. While you're there, give us a comment, follow, like, retweet, share, whatever floats your boat. Let us know how you're enjoying the podcast. Or perhaps you'd prefer to provide your feedback in a more private setting. Send us an email at crewofjapanpodcast at gmail.com. K-R-E-W-E-O-F-J-A-P-A-N-P-O-D-C-A-S-T at gmail.com. Speaking of feedback, if you're enjoying what you're listening to right now, or last season, or all the other seasons that we have, please feel free to leave us a five-star rating and or review on your favorite podcast streaming app. Every single one of those five-star ratings and reviews helps others interested in Japan and this kind of content find the podcast. Or hey, maybe just let a friend know about us. Anyway, I'm 100% sincere when I say that any and all support is incredibly appreciated. We are so excited to be back for season five, and I hope you're excited too. But that's it for today. Until next time. Looking to start your own podcast and don't know what platform to use? Tell me about it. When we started the Crew of Japan podcast, we tried a bunch of the big name recording platforms, but always came back to the one we're still currently using to this day, Zencaster. Zencaster is now the all-in-one solution making podcasting easy. In addition to its high audio and video quality for podcast production, Zencaster provides a full suite of production tools to record, produce, and publish studio quality content from the comfort of your home. Just log in through your browser and start recording. It's that simple. For us, we simply send out links to our guests and they join the lobby. But before you know it, it's all done and you have your studio quality audio and up to 4K video right there ready for you right when you finish. The best part is having their multi-layered backups to ensure that your recordings are in the highest quality, regardless of anyone's internet connection stability. With Zencaster's all-in-one podcasting platform, you can create your podcasts in one place and distribute to all the major destinations. It's really that easy. Go to Zencaster.com slash pricing and use our code Crew of Japan, K R E W E O F J A P A N, and you'll get 30% off your first month of any Zencaster paid plan. We want you to have the same easy experiences we do for all of our podcasting and content needs. It's your time to share your story.